I would say 15 to 20 percent of our patients are on terzepatide. Um, and unlike five years ago when we started using semaglutide in patients and were just watching muscle fall off these people, and, and frankly, my point of view five years ago was, I don't know about these drugs. I, I think you know, I think there's some benefit in some people, but I, I think there's a lot of downside. I, I today think that virtually anybody can use these drugs safely, but uh, and by safely, I, I don't just mean in the obvious sense of the word. I mean safely for long-term muscle health as well, right? Um, but it requires a ton of deliberate attention. So I'm glad you brought it up. That's This is exactly the group of people who you want to be using easy-to-digest protein sources. Um, and if you're on terzepatide, you don't really want a steak. <laughs> you know, you don't really want to have a big chicken breast. You, don't, you know, it, it, you might not want to even have an omelet. Um, but if we have to make sure you're hitting that 1.6, um, you might be doing a bunch of liquid shakes. Right. And, and yeah, we can sit here and poo-poo processed food and say, how disgusting is it that people have to resort to eating shakes? Okay, fine. But if the alternative is they're not getting enough protein and they're on a drug that is making them anorexic, I mean, we, know, we, we also know the downside of that. Well, the answer is clear, right? You don't want to be losing muscle mass, for sure. My point is, you know, we do DEXA before and after, we're not seeing the type of muscle loss we saw with our, you know, V1 approach to this. Right. What what kind of dose? Are, you, are they on like a higher dose? Really no. Dose? I mean, I think for, look, for, you know, terzepatide starts at 2.5. Some people are, are getting enough benefit there. I mean, the other thing that I, I think our approach has been is that um, slow and steady wins the race, right? So we've seen anecdotally some data. Uh, I've seen, I've heard from uh, from others and we've seen it as well, that yo-yoing on and off these drugs is probably a bad idea. So I always tell a patient, look, I'd, I'd probably rather you were on 2.5 milligrams until there was a new drug that we felt was even better than you, you're on 10 milligrams, you lose a ton of weight, you come off, you gain, you go back on, you lose. Like I, this, the idea of being on a, a saw is, is probably a bad idea. Um, I think the data, uh, suggest you're getting most of the value by about 10 milligrams. So once you go to 12.5 and 15, which are the two highest doses, you're still getting a benefit. Um, but it's, you know, it's like most drugs, you're getting most of the benefit at the lowest dose. So five to 7.5 milligrams of terzepatide is probably where you're getting the majority of the dose. And again, I, I'd much rather a patient be sort of slow and steady on it and as opposed to try to go for maximum and rapid weight loss. What do you what do you think about some of that data on like heart issues or bone loss? Um, do you think does that concern you at all? Sure, I think it all does. I mean, I think all of this stuff has to be paid attention to, and and I think the question again comes back to how much of that is occurring due to um, due, due to training, right? How much of that is happening due to the loss of amino acid intake and the loss of training? Or the neuropsychiatric? I mean, like that's another one. The eyes. What I'm interested in is, you know, we have these GLP-1 receptors like on so many different tissues. So what systemically, like how is it beneficial? Is it not beneficial? Like I don't know that we really know. We have, we have data where there's obviously positive effects. You see like reduced Alzheimer's disease incidence with people taking these GLP-1 receptor agonists. But is that how much is that is due to like weight loss, right? Yeah, we, we've looked into this a lot because I'm, I do remain – you know, it's funny, we did a podcast on this somewhat recently where um, I went through this particular question, which is, will GLP-1 receptor agonists ultimately prove to be gyroprotective? And I defined, I came up with a very obscure way to define that, which is independent of weight loss. <laughs> yeah. Right. Because obviously at the macro level, they're going to be gyroprotective because if you apply them to people with type 2 diabetes and significant obesity, and you correct the metabolic dysfunction, you're going to live longer. So by that regard, it's a gyroprotective agent. But the real question is, if you take a person who is of normal weight, who does not have type 2 diabetes, but maybe has a higher risk for Alzheimer's disease, and you microdose them, so you're giving them 2.5 milligrams per day, which, by the way, we are doing in some patients for, metabolic, for obscure metabolic condition without obesity, right? So we have patients who have um, um, 
who have diabetes but are already at very low body weight. We have two patients actually in our practice in this, in this regard. And after lots of detailed back and forth machination with uh, Ralph DeFranza, who's a previous guest on the podcast, you know, we sort of realized that the, at least one component of the drug regimen for these patients was going to be a GLP-1 agonist. Now, it seemed very counterintuitive to give terzepatide to people who have a BMI of 23. Um, but we've been able to do it without them losing weight. Um, so again, very careful strategies around nutrition and the effect on their diabetes is profound. So they're, lo they're looking more metabolically healthy. Oh my God, totally. I mean, these are, these are, these are, these are really interesting cases that, uh, you know, maybe at some point, obviously in a de-identified way, it would be interesting to talk about where, you, you know, you have OGTTs that are unrecognizable. Like you simply cannot believe the degree of metabolic dysfunction in a person who otherwise looks the way they look. And <clears throat> in one case in particular, it was so confusing that even after all the genetic testing we did, like we simply couldn't figure out an answer for this. We couldn't understand where the beta cell fatigue was coming from, absent a formal diagnosis of type 1 diabetes. Um, and within three months of being on 2.5 milligrams of terzepatide, this individual's OGTT had almost normalized, and I suspect uh, by about six months it will. That's fascinating. And, and we've managed to do this without any weight loss. So this to me is the interesting question, right, which is when you look at some of the Alzheimer's biomarkers, um, which are improving, improving significantly, um, it begs the question, should this be part of the playbook for an individual who's at high risk? Especially given that <clears throat> we now, I think, really understand how to make sure people don't lose weight and don't lose lean mass, and therefore, I suspect, don't lose bone density and all these other things that matter. Or, like you said, you know, if you're doing if you're doing like this microdose, like maybe you're you're not going to be as satiated. Like you'll you'll still have somewhat of an appetite because you're on such a low dose. Maybe you're going to do have a little bit of. An We've also seen some other weird things anecdotally. Um, patients have told us that when they inject in the abdomen. Uh, so when you inject in, you know, the fat, the sub-Q fat of the abdomen, the, uh, the anti, uh, uh, basically the anorexic effects are greater than if you inject in the leg or butt. Hmm. And we looked into this and there was some, some mechanistic data to suggest that maybe you're getting more vagal tone when you inject in the abdomen. Again, I, I, do, I just don't know if any of these things are correct. They would need to be studied. But again, that would be a very important piece of data, right? If there's a way that, if there's a location you can inject this where you minimize the uh, anorexic effect of the drug, again, for some people that would be a feature, not a bug. Right. For some people that would be a bug as opposed to a right. feature. So you, gotta, you have to understand how to, how to, how to, use, how to use the tool. Thank you.